Well, welcome back to this evening. Glad that we have all been able to return. And uh, we are continuing our study in the Old Testament, as we've been talking about before. Tonight, we're going to do something a little different again. When we've been going through the, King, uh, through the Samuels and the Kings, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, we dealt with each book separately. Because of the content of 1st and 2nd Chronicles, we're going to cover both books at the same time tonight. Uh, because uh, really, in retrospect, what's happening as we go into 1st and 2nd Chronicles is we are rehashing, okay, basically what has been covered in the Kings, okay? Uh, and as we go further in this, you'll see why the Chronicles as opposed to the Kings, and we'll also talk a little bit about uh, its placement in, in the Bible. It's placed differently in the Hebrew Bible than it is in our English Bibles, and so we'll talk a little bit about that as well. But we're going to cover both, both books tonight, and so as we uh, go into our introduction, let's begin with this. The, the two books of Chronicles focus primarily on the religious foundations and fortunes of Judah. Remember the kings, they talked about both Israel and Judah. But the Chronicles focuses in just on one segment of the divided kingdom. The northern kingdom of Israel will, will hardly be mentioned at all. So the Chronicles focuses in specifically upon Judah, focuses specifically upon the covenant people of Jehovah, because remember, the, the two tribes of Judah, this is where Jerusalem was, right? The two tribes of Judah were the last to go into captivity. Israel went into captivity before they did, right? And it will talk about as well the, the, uh, the years of the kings, but the kings of Judah only. They don't talk, the chroniclers don't talk about the kings of the, nor the, of the northern tribes, just the southern tribes of Judah, okay? So that begins to give us an idea of the distinction between 1st and 2nd Chronicles and 1st and 2nd Kings. And when we take a look at 1st and 2nd Chronicles, basically we're talking about solid history. Okay, again, 1st and 2nd Chronicles is one of those books in the Old Testament that we may find a little difficult to read, or not difficult to read, but it is more dry in its content because it's just solid history. And also, even though it's solid history, it is selective in its character, right, uh, of that content, because it reveals basically a, a very thorough going through of the theological and spiritual purpose of these books. So we we get in a little deeper with with First and Second Chronicles. So here's what we understand with regard to these books: they were written after the Babylonian captivity was over. When we talked about the kings, it talked about the captivities for both the northern tribes of Israel and the southern tribes of Judah. And it was written about around the time it was happening. The one who wrote the Chronicles writes all about this with regard to Judah after the Babylonian captivity is over. Okay, So they've gone through their, basically their 70 years of captivity, and now they are returning back to the land. When the chronicler writes the uh, books of Chronicles. So they're written after the Babylonian captivity is over. And one can see with that in mind why the writer emphasized such things as family heritage, okay? Also emphasizing things like the covenant, the covenant between God and his people, concentrated on the temple, because that's where God dwells in Jerusalem. Also talked about and focuses on the dangers of apostasy. Okay, remember, this is all being written after they've been taken captive and after they start returning to the land. So the experience of what happens when you uh, fall away from God, okay, or the apostasy, the chronicler is going to write about that. Plus, as well, he includes in there the Messianic hopes in the Davidic line. Because remember, it's the Davidic line through whom come, through who comes. Who comes through the Davidic line? The Messiah, right? Jesus, okay? And because it's the Davidic line, we're talking still about the southern tribes of Judah, we're talking about Jerusalem, the temple, all the rest of those things, all are encapsulated in the books of the Chronicles. So that gives us an idea why the emphasis that it has. Now that the Jews have returned to their homeland under Ezra's leadership, guess which book is after 2 Chronicles? That would be Ezra. Okay? So, 
here's, here's what's happening. Half the Jews have, now that they've returned to the homeland under Ezra's leadership, what they needed now was every encouragement and persuasion to rebuild the theocracy that had collapsed over a hundred years earlier, right? Remember when we talked about the early history of Israel, what God wanted with his nation? He wanted a theocratic nation. God would be its leader, right? An earthly king would be the one that would be the connection, the connecting point between God and the people, right? That whole thing collapsed. They were divided kingdom, taken into captivity, and so it's over a hundred years since all of this collapse took place. And now the writer of the Chronicles is going to help the people understand what they need to do and how they, they need to uh, do that. And the encouragement and the persuasion to rebuild what has been destroyed. The books of Chronicles basically are this. A clear warning to the people never again to forsake the temple and the worship of the living God. Because that's basically what happened. They forsook the temple. They forsook worshiping the living God. They went after idols. That's the reason why they were taken into captivity. So now that they're coming back, the chronicler is saying, okay, being forewarned is forearmed. <laughs> Let's not do this again, <laughs> is basically what the chronicler is saying, right? And, and so that gives us uh, uh, an idea now what the chronicler is, is doing. So that already begins to give us a bit of a distinction between 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles. But again, as we go further, we'll see some further distinctions that will, uh, that will help us along. So, let's talk about outlines, okay? And uh, let's deal, first of all, with 1st Chronicles. Since we have the book divided into two, 1st Chronicles, 2nd Chronicles, that's the, the, the major division, but there's a couple of divisions that we'll do in, within those two books. So with regard to First Chronicles, let's say this. The first nine chapters deal with the genealogies, okay? So here's those, those times again where we start reading so-and-so begat so-and-so, who begat so-and-so, who begat so-and-so, right? Again, because of our unfamiliarity with who is being mentioned in there, uh, and all the rest of it, that becomes heavy slogging for us, but still very important content. And it needs to be there for us so that we can catch up to perhaps what we've missed in the first recitation of the, of the history of the nation of Israel. So the genealogies cover basically the first nine chapters, and then chapters 10 through 29 of First Chronicles covers the reign of David. Okay? First Kings covered the reign of who? You remember? Saul. No. Saul would be Saul. Saul was the first king, right? Okay, then when we got into second kings, that's when we talked about David, if you remember. David and, and, and Saul. Here in First Chronicles, we're talking of the chapters 10 through 29, concentrating on the reign of David. Okay? Then when we move into Second Chronicles. The first nine chapters, there you go, Clark. The first nine chapters deal with the reign of Solomon. Notice which king is missing in the Chronicles. Saul's not mentioned. Saul's not mentioned. Only David and Solomon. Okay? So, the, again, here's the selective nature of the Chronicles. Okay? We're not going to talk about King Saul, we're going to talk about King David. We're going to talk about King Solomon, and then after Solomon, chapters 10 through 36 deal with the kings or the rulers of Judah, because by the, by after the reign of Solomon, we have the divided kingdom, okay? And so this part of 2 Chronicles deals with the divided kingdom, but only concentrates on the kings of Judah. It doesn't concentrate on the kings of Israel at all. I wonder why it, uh, okay, that's why Solomon is ruled out. That's one of the reasons why Saul was ruled out. Yes, yeah, he wasn't counted in the in the entourage of the, of the of the kings because again we're concentrating on Judah, we're concentrating on Jerusalem. Okay, all right, that help you along. Okay, so that helps us then understand how this book or how the, these books. I mean, we've divided them into first and second, but in the original Hebrew, it was one book, just like with Kings, just like with Samuel. This was one book in the Hebrew Bible as well, but we divided it up 
this way is again to make it easier to remember. So we're talking about the genealogies first, it gets us caught up. Then we talk about the reign of David, we talk about the reign of Solomon, and then the rest of the Judean kings, okay? To help us in that history. And again, it is a selective history. What the kings talk about, the chroniclers don't necessarily talk about. Okay? But we'll talk about the history of David and Solomon and the rulers of Judah from a bit of a different perspective. All right? So let's give a background to uh, these books. Let's talk about the title first. In the Hebrew Bible, as I already said, the books of Chronicles are one book. And if we were going to go back to the Hebrew language, basically what the Hebrew Bible does and how they get the titles for the books is from the first few words of the very first chapter. So in this case, in 1 Chronicles, when we come to chapter 1, we talk about the accounts of the days of whomever the chronicler names, okay? And we find this phrase often. That was the Hebrew title. Now, I didn't give you the how I didn't give you the Hebrew title in the Hebrew language because it's not going to mean anything for you, even if I if I were to say it for you. But that's where they get the Hebrew title from, the accounts of the days, okay? Or as we talk about the chronicles, right? Chronology. All the rest of those things. So that's, this is Jerome, one of the church fathers, okay, of, of way back, even before Clark's time, okay, <laughs> way back, right? Long <laughs> time. Jerome viewed the text of, of, this, of these chronicles as a, notice, a chronicle of the entire divine history, okay? So Jerome, because he was writing in Latin, okay, in his Latin titles, basically when you take those, they translate for the later English Bibles as First and Second Chronicles. So that's why we call it what we call it. It comes from the Latin, okay? Why would you do that? Because that was the language of the church. Yeah, that was the language of the church, yeah, yeah. Aren't you glad that we now have English? I write on English. That's right, that's right. So that was the language of the church then, okay? That's the language that the Bible was written in. And uh, so that's where the titles come from. So when you think about First and Second Chronicles, think about chronology. Think about time, right? Talking about how history marches on. That's basically First and Second Chronicles. That's how it got its title. When we take a look at the date of the author of First and Second Chronicles, we estimate this. The Chronicles was written in the latter half of the 5th, 5th century BC, somewhere between 450 and 425. We're not quite sure if it's, you know, 428 to 434 or whatever, doesn't matter. We've, we've narrowed it down to about the span of 25 years, okay? And when you're going back that far, you know, 25 years, <laughs> that's not a lot of time, okay? And uh, so that's where we estimate uh, Chronicles being written around the time between 450 and 425. Some Bible students have suggested that Chronicles and Ezra were originally uh, one consecutive history. Okay? Again, in our English Bible, it's interesting. We've put First and Second Chronicles together, okay, right after First and Second Kings, and then the book after Second Chronicles is Ezra. Okay? So it's interesting how we've done that in our English Bibles. Okay? And in fact, we say that it's very likely that Ezra was the author of First and Second Chronicles. Okay? We uh, compare the writings of Ezra to First and Second Chronicles, and we find a lot of similarities in style, in words used, and so on. And so uh, a lot would say that uh, it's probable that Ezra was the author of First and Second Chronicles. Okay? But let's talk now about its place in the canon, okay? Remember, as we talked before, what, is, what do we refer to when we're talking about canon? Not that big, long barrel that's on top of two large wheels. We're not talking about the weapon. But we're talking about canon being the standard or the rule of our scriptures, right? We're talking about the canon. We're talking about the entirety of the scriptures now. The place in the canon for these books, again, let's remember, Chronicles is the last book listed in the Hebrew Bible. Okay? So when you take a look at the Hebrew Bible, the very last book of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, you'll find 1st and 2nd Chronicles. Okay? Now remember, 1st and 2nd Chronicles was written after the people returned from the Babylonian captivity. 
So when you take a look at the Hebrew Bible and how it's all laid out, what you find then is that after you get through, okay, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, it goes directly now into the major and the minor prophets. Why does it do that? Well, remember, who is ministering during the divided kingdom? The major and the minor prophets. Okay? So you get your history of the, the Saul's reign, you get the history of, the, of David's reign, you get the history of Solomon's reign, you get the history of the kings of Israel and Judah. The Hebrew Bible goes now into the major and minor prophets. You go through the wisdom literature after that, and then you come to the very end of the Hebrew Bible, and it reviews for you the history of David and Solomon and the kings of Judah. So what happens in the Hebrew Bible now is that 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Chronicles kind of act like bookends. Okay? You've got the history over here. You've got all the other stuff in the Old Testament. Major minor prophets, wisdom, literature, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. You have all of that in there. And then it ends again with a reminder of the history of the nation of the Israelite people. Especially when it surrounds the, the, the reign of King David and King Saul. So they act as bookends in the Hebrew Bible. But what we've done in our English Bible is we've placed 1st and 2nd Chronicles right after 1st and 2nd Kings. With its placement in the Hebrew Bible, what this suggests for us is that the early Jews looked upon it as, a very, as, as being very distinct from Kings, despite the similar historical reporting. There is a distinction, again, between 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st Chronicles. That's why they place the, the books where they do, in their order. Okay? So, with that in mind, this is the reason why... Oh, I've skipped on my notes here. Chronicles. Let's compare that with Kings now. Okay? The books of Chronicles are more selective than the Kings. Okay? Kings covers more historical detail than the Chronicles do. So Chronicles are, are, are more selective than the Kings. And this is illustrated in the fact that the Northern Kingdom of Israel, again, as I mentioned before, is hardly ever mentioned. Okay? They're not concerned about what happened up north. <laughs> That's all over and done with. Okay? As well as the Babylonian captivity is all over and done with. What the author does is he makes prominent the unbroken thread, although at times the thread becomes very, very slender, very, very thin. <laughs> but what he does is he makes prominent the unbroken thread of the covenant promise from the earliest days and through the Davidic dynasty represented again by the house of Judah. The house of Judah is part of the Davidic line. Okay? And so what Ezra, if we're going to say that Ezra is the author, and I think there's good enough reason to say that he is, what Ezra does is he talks about God's covenant promise with his people. Now, when he's talking about his covenant promise with his people, he's talking about he's going all the way back to Abraham. Remember Genesis chapter 12, right? And the covenant that God makes with Abraham that from his seed will rise a great people. And what Ezra does now through the Chronicles is help us to understand how all of that comes together. Okay? It's the realization and the need for those first nine chapters of First Chronicles where it talks about the genealogies. Okay? So as tempting as it is to skip over the genealogies because it's full of names that we can't pronounce <laughs> and people that we don't recognize, it's very important for us because what Ezra does is helps us to see how it all ties together. So that we see God's continuing plan, His redemptive plan, through uh, through God's promise with His people. That's why we have included in First and Second Chronicles three major things. First of all, again, as I mentioned before, the genealogies. What happens here is the Davidic line and the descendants of Levi. Why are the descendants of Levi important? Who are the Levites? The, ones, the, priests. the priests, the ones who are formulating the worship of the temple, right? Yeah. So here we go. The genealogies for the Davidic line, the descendants of Levi, and the two tribes of Judah and Benjamin are of chief interest. Okay? Because those were the, the two tribes of, of Judah 
after the, after the uh, divided kingdom. All right? You also have the high points of Judah's history right on up to its captivity. Okay? The, the Judeans were the ones that were taken captive into Babylon. Right? The Israelites were taken captive into Assyria. Plus, you also have a prominent place given to the temple, given to the priesthood, and the other worship items. What Ezra is doing is helping the people understand how all of this came to be. Because remember what's, what's happening. Because this was written after the Babylonian captivity, you have an entire generation of people that have been out of Jerusalem. You have an entire generation of people that have, that have not seen the temple. You have an entire generation of people that don't necessarily have an understanding of what the forefathers did when they were still in Jerusalem worshiping God. So now, as Ezra covers this history for this generation, after they go back to the land, that helps them understand the reason why they're rebuilding the temple, the reason why they're rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem, and why they're coming back to, as some of the prophets said, back to the old ways. Back to the ways in which they worshipped God before. They've been out of they've been out of uh, Jerusalem for all of these years, right? And now Ezra's, along with the others that are working with him, looking at retraining the people with regard to how they are to worship God and why the temple is significant. Okay. So all of that, when we keep that in mind, when we're reading those books helps us gain the perspective of a person who's learning some new things, okay, and why the history is selective. If we start talking about Israel and what happened in the northern kingdoms, perhaps it's going to bring great confusion, okay? So we're not going to talk about that, we're just going to talk about Judah, okay? Hence the reason for it being so selective, okay? So that helps us then understand why the chronicler does what he does. Okay, yep. Mm -hmm. uh, how many times, and how many times has it been since they've rebuilt that? Uh, let's get back to the basics, see? Eh? Uh -huh. Back to uh, how the Lord wants you to worship Him and how He wants you to live and everything else. So is that not, uh, since Christ has come now, okay? Right. We accept it in our lives. Yeah. Or we don't. So, uh, they don't have another shot at this, do they? No. <laughs> no. That's why the Chronicler said, listen, let's not do this again. Yeah, period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's make sure that we've got this down and that we keep with it and we keep at it. Okay? So let's talk about the prominent subjects, all right, of First and Second Chronicles. Again, we have to address the genealogies. That takes us from verse 1, chapter 1, right through to the end of verse uh, 44 of chapter 9. And uh, let's remind ourselves, the genealogies that are listed there, even though it takes up nine chapters, these genealogical lists are not exhaustive. Okay? They highlight the high points of those genealogies. So the genealogies are not exhaustive, they're selective. Okay, there's a purpose behind the selections of those names. Okay, how do you do that? which ones? Yeah, yeah, and it's all back to wanting to support the purposes of the book. Again, what's the purposes of the book? It's a new generation coming back into the to the promised land. Okay, coming to reestablish Jerusalem, and they have to get a, a quick. Cole's Notes history <laughs> of how all of this has come together through the family lines. Because it's very important, especially when they're rebuilding the temple and they're reestablishing the priesthood, it's very important that the priesthood remain pure in its bloodline. So the question is, okay, you want to be a priest or a Levite within the temple, whose bloodline, whose family line do you belong to? And you see it as you read it, if they can't figure out, if they can't figure out which family line or what line you belong to, if they can't figure it out, you're not part of the Levitical group. You're not part of the priesthood. We have to have assurances that you're from the proper bloodline. Okay? So, they're very uh, picky about, uh, about these things. Okay? 
Hence the reason again for the genealogies. So with, with people back then, were they have kept me for themselves track? Yes. Who, who their ancestors Oh, yes, yes. The bloodlines were very important. Uh, in fact, when you get into books like Ezra and Nehemiah, when we get there, you'll see it too. You'll find that for, for many, as, as they were involved in the northern tribes okay, of Israel, and they're wanting to come back now, some of them can't tell what their bloodline is because they did not keep that up. They did not keep that information up. And because they did not keep that information up, basically what they were told is you can, you can be here, but we don't know what tribe you're of, and so you cannot serve in the temple. Okay, so very, very important. And so some families kept, kept exhaustive records and some didn't. And there was a price to pay for that. Okay, this is where we start getting into the, again, the whole factor of when we get into the New Testament of the, of the Samaritan people, right? And where did the Samaritan people come from? Well, what we remember, they intermarried the, the, northern, the northern tribes of Israel in the, in the divided kingdom they intermarried with non-Jews. And what happens is you now have mixed bloodlines, okay? And that's why the Samaritan people were so despised by the Jewish people. You know, basically they were viewed as being, you know, excuse the term, but called half-breeds and, and things like this. Right? Well, the lot sign that uh, married the Samaritans? Uh, I'd, have to, I'd have to look back at the family tree. As we said earlier, right, there's lots of knots in the family tree, and I'd have to, have to take a look to see which branch we're looking at again. <laughs> so just like your family tree and my family tree, their family tree had a lot of knots as well. David's reign and temple plans are talked about in 1 Chronicles uh, chapters 10 through, through 29. Remember, David is not the one who built the temple originally. But he was the one that put the plans together and got the materials together so that his son Solomon, and during his reign, he would be the one to build the temple, right? And he was head of the temple project. And uh, Second Chronicles, when we get into the second part of Chronicles now, starting in chapter 1, going through the end of chapter 9, helps us to understand the temple project that Solomon was involved in during his reign. Now... The extent of Solomon's domination was far-reaching, okay, and I will have a map here for you to, to see uh, what it looks like. Basically, when King Solomon reigned, his domination was from the Euphrates River in the east and north of the Middle East, all the way down to the border of Egypt in, uh, in the west and the uh, south. And as I promised, I would have a map for you. So here's the map. This red area, okay, is present day Israel, okay. as close as we can get it, okay, all right? You have here the Sea of Galilee, you have the Dead Sea, and of course between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea you have the Jordan River. This is present day Israel as we know it. The yellow portion was Solomon's Israel. This is the area that he reigned over, so again, it goes all the way up to the Euphrates River, up to the north northeast and all the way down to the Egyptian border in the southwest okay this is the closest that Israel came to occupying all of the promised land that God had promised this still wasn't all of it okay even in Solomon's time this is as close as they got okay so, when you take a look at that area, we estimate that the area of Solomon's reign was some 50,000 square miles, okay, of his domination as he, uh, as he was king of, uh, of Israel, okay? Now, that looks like a huge area of land. That's nothing in comparison to later on in the history of the scriptures when we talk about the king of Persia or the kings of Persia the Persian Empire it spanned far far more than even this <laughs> and during the time of the Persian kings included even this area okay it basically went from the Mediterranean all the way to the Persian Gulf okay that's uh, how wide the Persian kings land of, of influence was but here's what Solomon 
was able to do during, during his reign. And, of course, he, he builds the temple during this time. In fact, the temple, which Solomon built, was the first large single structure undertaken by the Israelite nation. Okay? So, and by an Israelite ruler. So, uh, it was a large project and was a project that established Israel as a nation because this is the temple where God worked. Of course, Second Chronicles doesn't stop there because we know what happens after, right? We have to deal with the split of the kingdom and chapter 10 in Second Chronicles picks that up for us and uh, gives us a little bit of an idea and history of that and then it begins to go into the kings of Judah in their reign until we get to indeed again the fall of Judah, the captivity of Babylon and all of this sounds familiar because remember 1st and 2nd Kings covered all of this, okay? 2nd Chronicles is covering it again. So we revisit the fall of Judah, the captivity of Babylon. But what happens with 2nd Chronicles is we say that it ends on a high note. We have at the end of 2 Chronicles the decree of King Cyrus, King of Persia. Okay? Remember, this was written, 2 Chronicles was written after the Babylonian captivity is over. And then the last two verses of 2 Chronicles in chapter 36, we find this. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, King of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is among you of all his people? May the Lord his God be with him, and let him go up. There's the decree. The Babylonian captivity is over, and because the Spirit of God stirs up King Cyrus's heart, the king of Persia says this to the Jewish people. Go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple to the Almighty God. That's what you need to do. And what he does is he not only tells the people to go and do that, but he also provides Letters so they can go throughout the nations of his kingdom unabated, okay? Because again, <laughs> when you're going through all of those miles and all of those kingdoms, you may have some people say, hey, 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 wait a minute, what are you doing? Aren't you supposed to be back in Babylon? No, 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 they have letters to prove. This is by direct order of the king, decree of the king. But not only does he give them letters of decree, but he also gives them materials to take with them so they can begin to rebuild the temple. Well, this just proves to us, again, and we've seen it time and time again. In fact, the psalmist even says it, does he not? That the, that the, the heart of the king is in the hand of who? In the hand of God. And so, as God had promised through the prophets, before they were taken captive, and while they were captive, what did God promise his people? That he would return them back to the land. Here's the decree at the end of 2 Chronicles that reminds us of that decree. 2 Chronicles ends on a high note. Okay? Now, for us, where we place 1 and 2 Chronicles in our English Bibles, that makes perfect sense because the very next book that we will go into when we get together again next week is we'll talk about the book of Ezra. Well, Ezra, why does he return back to Jerusalem? Why does he lead a group of people from the Babylonian captivity back to Jerusalem? Why are they there? To rebuild the temple. All right? So we see that connection. With 2 Chronicles, 1 Chronicles being placed at the end of the Hebrew Bible, okay, it's interesting that that decree is the very last part of the Old Testament Hebrew Bible, right? Reminding the reader again, this isn't where the story ended. There was still... More to be done. Now, that's all included in the books of the Hebrew Old Testament as it's before 1st and 2nd Chronicles, but the decree is where the Old Testament Hebrew Bible ends, on a high note. On a high note. That happy ending thing that we all like, right? 
Same kind of idea here. All right? So, prominent subjects of, of the Chronicles as we uh, go through it. But again, what's the one question that we haven't answered yet? You know what that question is, don't you? Uh, so what? So what? Yes, you got it. Let's answer that question. So what? All right, we've got this book. First and Second Chronicles, what about? What does it mean for me? Because it covers a lot of history that I was never involved in. I have, as far as I know, no relatives, living or dead, that were included in that historical <laughs> rendition. So what does it mean for me? Well, I think there's several things that we can, we can uh, find here. First of all, we find that through both First and Second Chronicles, there are many spiritual lessons that can be learned, even from the genealogies. Okay, and this is why you've heard me say this from time to time. Don't skip over the genealogies. Okay? If you're a particular person who, who, who is like me, who has a regimented list of passages that I read of the Bible that I read each day, the reason why I do that is so that I can go through the entire scriptures in a segment of time. And what's tempting is you get to those sections in my, in my list of readings for the day. When I get to those sections that have just genealogies, the temptation is just to skip that. Again, we're talking about names you can't pronounce all this stuff. Let's not be so cavalier with the genealogies. Let's go into them. Let's dive into them again and see what can we learn even from the genealogies. With first and second Chronicles, or the first nine chapters of the first Chronicles, we find some spiritual lessons there that are very important for us to learn. And so we don't want to, we don't want to skip out on those. Not only are there spiritual lessons that can be learned from the genealogies, but there's also spiritual lessons that we learn and gain as we review. Remember, first second Chronicles is a review of the Davidic reign and the Solomonic reign. So there are spiritual lessons from the lives of David and Solomon that we can gain as well. Stuff there that is rehearsed because it's in, 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 in Second Kings, but also some tidbits here and there that the Chronicles talks about that the Kings don't. Right? And so some spiritual lessons there in the lives of David and Solomon. It's in these books as well that we are taught about the character of God. Remember, again, being written after the Babylonian captivity. Ezra is looking at it from a different perspective than from the writer of 1st and 2nd Kings. He's now looking at it after everything is done. Not just the divided kingdom, but also the captivity is done, and now the people are returning. What do we learn about God? What do we learn about His character? What do we learn about His nature as we see God now after the captivity is over? There's lots of things that we can be taught about the character of God in this book. Uh, one, one prime one being, again, His grace and His mercy, right? After the captivity, what does He do? He returns His people back to the land. That's a gracious God. He didn't have to do that, but He chose to do it, all right? So that's one of the major things we learn about the character of God in this book. We also learn this as well, and I've, and I've already mentioned this, right? The heart of the king is in the hand of God. And what Ezra does for us is, as he uh, writes this book of the Chronicles is we see many times how God moves the heart of the king. And that's easy to see now because we're now on the backside of the captivity looking back, right? We've seen, it, we, we've seen how he's done all of that. When we're in the midst of what's happening in our lives and our circumstances, we often think or feel that we don't see God at work. It's only after we've gone through the ordeal, right, that we, when we look back on it, now we see how God has been at work, but we didn't see it while we were in it. Well, here's what's happening in the Chronicles, right? Now that we're on the backside of the captivity, we can look back on it and say, ah, so that's how God was at work. We didn't see it then, but we see it now. And we see often where the heart of the king indeed is in the hand of God, especially again when we come to the king of Persia, Cyrus, the king of Persia. And God specifically, as the Chronicle reminds us, moves Cyrus's heart and helps Cyrus realize what he wants of his people who are captive under his reign. 
Here's what you need to do, Cyrus. And if I if he wouldn't have done that for any other people under his captivity, it would just be God's chosen people. We don't have any record of that. Yeah. So isn't that an amazing mm -hmm. thing? You know? yeah. He must have been amazed by it himself. Yeah. He may have very well been, yes. Because he probably would have been pagan worshippers. Oh yes, absolutely. Isn't it not true that uh, you know uh, <clears throat> the heart of the heart of God and how He uh, isn't it just about exactly the opposite? Every, how He handles every situation is just about the opposite of how we would handle it. Yeah, it usually is. <laughs> yeah, and so when we come back to you know we're taught about the character of God in this book, we even see His wisdom, right? We even see His wisdom. So there it is. First and Second Chronicles. I said we would cover both tonight, and, and we did. And uh, even though, again, it's selective history, still very valuable for us, his people, to see how he works, how he acts, how he moves in the hearts and the lives of people, some who follow him, even some who don't. <laughs> and God still is at work. Well, I think that's a great encouragement for us in the day and age in which we live. As we see what's happening in nations around us, as we see leaders of nations rise and fall, and some leaders we like, and some leaders we don't like, right? Let us be reminded it's all part of that ultimate plan of God. He is the one who's in control. If the heart of the king was in the hand of God during this time of history, there's no reason why we would not say that it is not so today. The heart of the king is still in the hand of God. And we need to be reminded of that as we go through these days. There really is no reason to fear. God is still in control. And he will have his or even a person like Saddam Hussein, eh? right? When they when they hung him, mm -hmm. you know the atrocities and the way you, you know, I I still felt I didn't know his fear when they were going to hang him there, right? He was standing there, and I look at his face before, he, but I didn't know his fear, but I could feel what kind of fear I felt sorry for, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Even though you'd say to yourself, well, why don't you get that guy and stop him from it, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, uh, because of who he was to meet. Yeah. Right? And, uh, yeah. Well, let's pray. Our Father, again, we are reminded of your goodness to us. We are reminded of your, of your ultimate plans. We are reminded that you are a God who leaves no detail to chance. That you are one who works in and through your people, and you are also one who works in and through the people of this world. And so we thank you for your sovereignty. We thank you for your control. We thank you for the way in which your plan continues to move forward. First and Second Chronicles is a reminder to us of how your plan would continue to go forward. And we thank you for this perspective. Being able to look back on all of what you had done and seeing that from the perspective of after it was all completed. We see your hand at work. Father, remind us again that we can do the same thing. We can look back upon what has happened in our recent lives. We can look back on what has happened in our past life. And we can see again how you've been at work. That encourages us, Father, because we can continue to move on forward knowing that you will continue to lead us. Cause us to be ones who continue to be faithful and following. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.